Hello, everybody. Um, no pressure. I'm being filmed. I'm probably being drawn. It's all like, oh, my gosh. Anyway, I want to share with you this unbelievably amazing year that I have had. I can't believe how lucky I was to actually get this brilliant job. So, basically, Professor Sue He, who is director of the Morgan Centre for Research into Everyday Lives, which is a bunch of sociologists that work for the University of Manchester, sent me an email about 18 months ago and said, would you like to do, to have a grant to work with us for a year? And what she was interested in is the fact that sociologists, especially the Morgan Centre for Research into Everyday Lives, are interested in looking at the minutiae of what goes on around them. And it occurred to her that there was a lot of overlap between what they were doing and what we as urban sketchers do. After all, that's what it is, isn't it? We put ourselves in a space and we observe the everyday stuff. So she was excited by the idea that we might be able to work together and, and observe in different ways and see in the same situation what we picked up. So we got this grant and Lever Hume Trust do this amazing thing where they take an artist of any kind, it could be a dancer or a poet or a musician, and the only rule for getting the money is that you work with an institution that has nothing to do with the arts. And it's just this wonderful cross-fertilisation to see what happens. It's such a simple premise, but it's a really good idea. So we put in this bid and we got the money! Yay! <laughs> so I couldn't quite believe it. And uh, two days a week, um, just up the road at the University of Manchester, they were very flexible, you know, like sort of whenever anything good was going on. And I just hung about, really, drawing a year in the life of the department, but also drawing all their various research projects. Now, I know nothing, well, I knew nothing about sociology this time last year. So it was very exciting. It was that voyage of discovery that kind of got me really sort of up for it. So when we, when we got the money, I said to Sue, oop, sorry. I said to Sue, so, okay, what do sociologists actually do all day? And she said, well, to be honest, mostly we sit at computers or we sit in meetings and, oh yeah, it's actually not that visual really, is it? <laughs> but of course, that's because she wasn't an urban sketcher. And I think the whole point of what we do is that what we used to becomes invisible, but what we're not used to, for everybody else's eyes, is really exciting. You know, I come from this neck of the woods, Manchester, yeah, yeah some interesting buildings, but it looks like home. If you've come from Brazil or China or wherever, it's amazing, it's different, isn't it? So her world to me was very exciting, and one of the things I discovered is that academics have so much clutter in their life. Every surface was covered in stuff. Corners of rooms, death, everything was piled with stuff. And I loved the meetings because sociology was very um, easy to understand for a layman. So I learned all this new stuff. It was really brilliant. And I would go to meetings and try and record everybody and what they said and just get a feeling for the meetings. So the thing that we had in common was this idea of concentrated seeing. So they got very excited by the way in which urban sketchers place themselves in a space and then absorb the stuff that's around them because we're, we actually stand still, don't we? We stand still and we observe. And because we do that, we point up all the invisible stuff that normally you're just rushing past, you're getting on with your day, you're focusing on what you're gonna do next. You don't notice the stuff that's there all the time. So urban sketchers do this just as a matter of course, and it's also what sociologists do. So this is Professor Sue, Professor Sue Heath, um, at her desk, and I drew all her tea-making kit gear and her boots that sit under the desk and her pin board. I also did a portrait of her by the contents of her desk drawer. And uh, no, I thought it was quite a sociological thing to do. So we took her drawer out and I kind of did it kind of like an archaeological thing and all the, placed them all out on this big table, even down to the petrified rubber bands and the little bits of staples you get in the corner with all the fluff. And, and then just 
did the whole thing. And it was absolutely hilarious because 99.9% .9 of it was complete rubbish. <laughs> and what was really funny was she put it all back. She didn't throw <laughs> anything away. And she confided to me that that was not the desk drawer from that job. Like five years ago, she'd taken that desk drawer and all its contents from her last job. And so she's carrying all this rubbish around with her. So, so I like the idea that we record the moments in between the moments of significance. So I went to loads of kind of day-long seminars and there's all this important stuff going on. And then there's these moments of pause where everybody has their lunch or they all get a muffin and a cup of tea and they stand around and chat. And I think that sort of moment tells you as much about what it's like to be in academia as actually the meetings do themselves. But those moments just get forgotten, don't they? Um, so I, I love the idea that we can do that. We can shine light on these little places that just, yeah, are gone forever. Yeah, this is another good example. So this was an um, end of project presentation for Sue Heath. She was just finishing a big project when I started with them. So it was a big deal. They hired the art gallery, academics coming from all over the place, and the tech doesn't work. So there she is, ready, and you couldn't get the computers going. And there's this little huddle of people, you know, the technical issues bit. Um, so that's as important, really, for an outsider as the actual event. And of course, when you're drawing, you notice the, the little tiny stuff, the insignificant stuff, and that again is what the sociologists were quite interested in, because that's the stuff they're trying to point up. So one of the things that I noticed drawing in loads of lectures is that the students all come with water, very sensible, but all the lecturers always came with coffee. I don't know what it means, but I noticed it. <laughs> For me in particular, uh, ske sketching out and about is a multi-sensory experience. I really enjoy the fact that you place yourself in a space and then you're just still and you've got all this stuff that's happening around you. And you might be cold or you might be hot or there might be somebody really smelly sat over there. You know, or you listen in to things that are going on. And in particular, I listen, I keep my ears open. And I put little notes of that kind of thing. I weave it in amongst the, the drawings. And that then really paints a rich picture. So this was at the beginning of the term, sitting on the grass when it was sunny in Manchester with the students, and just listening to their conversations. Now, I went to university in my hometown. And it hadn't really occurred to me that people were, of course, they're coming to Manchester from all over the world. You know, a lot of them, they just arrived. They'd never been abroad before. But when I started to listen in, you know, there's somebody saying, I'm from Islamabad, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Here, let me show you. Desperate to show people on her phone. And somebody else said, I get homesick at the most awkward times, at the grocers, not in my room. And, and that kind of really starts to paint that picture, doesn't it? And then the lady on the phone, she was obviously local. She was pacing up and down, talking to this mate. And she, <laughs> she said... Uh, did you tell him? Oh my God, you slept with your... <gasps> wow! <laughs> so I never found out. But. And also background noises, that's the other thing. So this is the Oxford Road, which you may recognise now. Main access every day for me when I went in and out. So I knew I'd got to paint it. But it's kind of, I'm out of my comfort zone a bit with this sort of thing. So I've been putting it off and then one day, this Ferris wheel appeared, which really didn't belong. It was quite surreal. And so I thought, today's the day that really I need to record it so as I'll get that. So the only place I could sit to get this really nice view of it was actually on the curbstone next to the bus stop. So I'm kind of this far from the traffic. So it was not, wasn't very pleasant. Um, and it was very windy and it kept trying to snatch my sketchbook. And it did actually at one point go into the road and I had to quickly get it back before the bus ran it over. Um, so it was actually very multi-sensory. So I wrote down the things I could hear in the corner. So chatter rises and falls like birdsong, ambulance siren, traffic rumble, hip-hop from a car window, bus chunter in my face. And, and that is kind of like a soundtrack to the picture. 
and it just helps all together to paint something that really puts you in the space and in the moment. So I'm a storyteller. I'm actually an illustrator. I illustrate children's books. So that kind of feeds into my urban sketching. So I'm very interested in the way in which urban sketching tells stories. Now, mostly, they're not great big significant stories. Mostly, they're little tiny everyday stories that are happening all the time, all around you, like that sneeze, yeah? <laughs> trying to cover up the sneeze because you're filming. That's the story. It's funny. So I try and pick that stuff up. So this was a, a sketchbook that I was doing in a lab. So I'd spent the day with these very important scientists learning all about the fact that they were trying to synthesize smells like menthol by genetically altering E. coli. Apparently, if you feed E. coli different things, it poos out other things which are quite interesting, including rocket fuel, apparently. Um, so anyway, we were speaking to all these very important scientists. And then at the end of the day, I stepped out of a building a bit like this where you've no idea what's going on in the outside world. And it was torrential rain. And I thought that that kind of juxtaposition was also a part of the day. So when I got to the station, I quickly recorded that on the end of the sketchbook. So that little story is as important as the big story. I think what's lovely about the way you can tell stories with pictures is that you have this instant impact. So this was a, um, a tutorial with the new students, and they were all asked to bring an object in that they'd bought from their home, wherever that happened to be, the, their real home, to their halls of residence to try and bring a sense of home with them and to talk about the significance of that object. Um, and uh, so I tried as best I could to draw the objects while they were talking about them. And, you know, like the, the picture on the end, she died of cancer in 2007, and this is the last photo I have of her looking well. So this student carried this picture of her best friend around with her like a talisman. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the elephant, um, it was bought for me by my mum when we were in Jordan, and he keeps losing his tusks. <laughs> so, even inanimate things, it really insignificant things, have a story because we interact with them. So, I was drawing in the learning centre, um, it's just a bunch of students sat at a bunch of computers. And I'm sat on the floor, and I suddenly realised there was all this lovely, cool air coming out of a vent exactly like that one. And so I wrote, it's only when you sit on the carpet that I discover that there's cool air seeping gently into the room from lots of floor vents, which is why it's such a comfortable temperature, despite the presence of 40 computers. I also love the way in which you can be slightly cheeky and you can put a subtext into your drawings. If you focus your attention in certain places or you just put the tiniest little comment in there. This was another portrait. This is the portrait of the head of the department, um, Wendy Botero. Typical academic. Her office was like just stuffed to the gills, absolutely rammed. And I drew her through the contents of her office. And basically, I started at the door, and I worked my way round, panning round the room, drawing, 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 until I got back to the door at the other end of one of my big concertina sketchbooks. And, and this is the section. I left the bookshelves to the end because they were so scary. I really wasn't quite sure how on earth I was going to tackle them. And I did it in two instalments. I did like half a day, and then I came back the following week, and I did another half a day. And I was very annoyed with myself because it had this beautiful package and I got it half finished at the end of the first day. And, and all the way home, I'm cursing myself, thinking I should have just either got it finished or left it out. And now she's going to open it and I'll have this half finished blob in the middle of the thing and it's going to ruin the drawing. And I was very annoyed. Next week, it's in exactly the same place. <laughs> and it transpired, it had been in that place for about a year and a half. <laughs> So I said to her, what's in the big package? And she said, it's a map of Manchester. I suppose at some point we'll have to put it up. <laughs> and that kind of said everything you needed to know about Wendy's relationship to objects, really. You know, bigger things on her mind. 
And this again, this is like a portrait of the Morgan Centre. Hazel, who is just a clatter of keyboards, that arrow over there, um, she said it was quite funny, she thought it looked like she was in the box. <laughs> and you can just see her on, in the whiteboard reflection up there. Hazel is the one that makes everything happen in the Morgan Centre. She's like the chief administrator. She's the one who knows everything. And she organises all the conferences and seminars and things. And so she's the one that makes sure everything they need is there. But then at the end of a big day, you've got all this stuff. What do you do with it? Well, it might come in handy, so you chuck it behind Hazel's desk. So there's all this rubbish behind Hazel's desk, and it's a growing pile. And I particularly liked the three emergency clocks. <laughs> it's just so Morgan Center. And sometimes, actually, it's the artist story that's part of the whole thing, because you're there. And one of the things that's lovely is it's, it's slightly theatrical, really. You go into a space and you draw and you kind of affect what's going on around you. And I quite like that interaction. This was um, the lab again. Actually, I think this was the same lab. Um, and I was sort of being shown around the lab and drawing all the different processes. And they showed me these vials of stuff. This is where the E. coli is in these little things with, with this broth that they feed it. And they put them all in this block and then they put it in something that shakes it up. And I was drawing the block, and he'd shown me the thing, how it looked from underneath. I thought, I want to draw that. Lifted it up, and of course, instantly spilled all E. coli all up my arm. <laughs> so they kind of took me away and swabbed me off, and then gave me these latex gloves to draw in. And I thought it was so funny, because I couldn't be trusted. And, and I just love that very personal story embedded in the middle of this very serious sketchbook with mass spectrometers and things in it. And, and that juxtaposition is just really nice. So I worked in these concertinas. Um, and basically, I bought this huge roll of watercolour paper. It's 10 metres by 2 metres. And having bought it, I then realised that I didn't actually have anywhere big enough to roll it out to cut it up. So it was quite a performance. And wrestling it, because it was quite heavy and it wanted to stay rolled, you know, it's like wrestling an octopus. But eventually, I got all these strips, two meter strips cut, and folded them up. And they were perfect for storytelling, because of course you, you can tell a story as you work your way along the book. Instead of a series of snapshots, previously I'd always worked in a standard sketchbook, and you just go, boof, one hit. But I just got so excited by this idea that one thing became another, really. And you're, you're just following the story through. So this is me in a different lab where they were researching Alzheimer's. Um, so she's kind of t talking me through the process, trying to understand and trying to remember what she was telling me was quite a challenge. And then drawing it. But the thing with the concertinas is they were so practical because, you know, this, I'm sort of walking down the Oxford Road, suddenly all the daffodils were out. Oh, quick, let's draw it. Stood up in the street. You need something that is the shape of a sketchbook. So the concertinas are great because you can work on them as a book or you can fold them out so you've got maybe three sections with a bit of jiggery pokery. Um, but they gained up as something large that's got a bit more impact to them. So they were very practical. So this, they were on strike at some one point. So I thought, oh, good, that's a different story. So I came in and drew them on the picket line. But then again, I'm, I'm sort of like in the shelter of the building opposite, and it was raining, and you're trying, you know, you, you need a book, really. But it's always a problem, that, is how you actually present sketchbooks. Unless you're going to faff around doing loads of prints, it's actually very difficult to show people sketchbooks in an exhibition setting. So this was brilliant, because it meant I could have the small thing to work on, but when you unroll it, you've got the big thing to exhibit, something flat that you can put on the wall. I got really interested in time over the process of the year. I suddenly realised that what I was doing was recording passing time in different ways. So the concertinas were brilliant because you could follow time one moment to another to another. You know, time doesn't have barriers. It's just a flow. So I tried to actually flow the drawings together and use text to, to join them up. So you got this sense of ongoing time. But also you could use them for for a longer story by doing sequential stuff. So one day, I arrived at the university. Instead of the lovely green and a tree that was outside the Morgan Centre, it was just a big pile of earth with a great big digger on top. 
And apart from the fact that diggers are kind of good to draw, I thought, well, this is, again, it's a big story. Manchester, you will have noticed, it's shown one big building site. Um, so I drew the digger, but then, of course, nothing happens for a while. So I went away and I came back, and then I drew when they created all the footings. And the big machine that was so huge, there was just no way you could actually get that on the book, however I tried. So I had to do it in little bits, so, so there's sort of various senses of, of what this thing is doing, pumping the um, cement in. And then a bit later on, I came back and they've put the structure up. And I managed to get the students' comments, which I was quite pleased. So somebody said, oh, the building of Starbucks, right? I think a lot of people are saying, hey, what happened to our lovely green space? <laughs> the political comment. And, uh, and then at another point, the scaffolding went up. And then I was unfortunately running out of book by this point. So I had to really squish it up. And it was, in fact, a Blackwell's, but it had a Starbucks inside. Another way that I discovered that I could record time was by keeping a static viewpoint and watching the time unfold in front of me, so things slowly changing. So this was at the end of one of the seminar days, you know how you, when you sum up, and you write all the things you've learned on the whiteboard. And I just love the idea that by, by just keeping on this one person who was up and down and writing in different places, you get this really sense of time and movement, and it's much, I don't know, it, it's more evocative than just a still image would have been. And this was another good example of that. Um, we did a research project, well, I didn't, I was the fly on the wall, to a research project about dormant things, which is brilliant. We all have stuff in our life that we can't quite throw away. We don't actually want it, we don't need it, it serves no purpose, but it never quite makes it to the bin. It ends up in the attic or in that cupboard at the back, you know? And it's about why we do that and what these objects are and what the stories behind them are, the significance for different people. So I went into different people's homes and drew their stuff, which was pretty funny. Um, but there was a, a anonymity because they were research subjects. So I couldn't draw their faces. So quite often I drew their hands or their feet. Um, and I think the idea that when you're talking, I know I do, I'm doing all this sometimes, you, you actually tell the story with your hands if you just stand and watch people's hands as they're talking. So, so that's kind of quite a nice way of recording another little moment in time. And this is part of that project. So the other thing is you can kind of watch as time evolves and things unpack and you add as things happen. So we drew the contents of somebody's tea chest that they got stuffed in the corner of their living room. And as she pulled each object out, I added it and then I added the little story of it. So uh, yeah, an old crochet hook, remnants of when it was a knitting and sewing box in our old house, as well as a knitting needle. You know, <laughs> I should return the knitting needle to my knitting bag, but I won't. It will go back in there. You know, why do we do these things? Another thing that I thought was quite interesting was the echo that you leave in time and space when you do something over and over again. So, uh, you know, people who have normal jobs, <laughs> not like me, um, they tend to do the same journey to work, same place every day, sometimes in the Morgan Centre, up and down the stairs, several times a day. And I thought that was quite interesting. There was this kind of resonance in the space. So I used these, the concertina to actually record that as a series of drawings. So you can see the Oxford Road Station where everybody starts. That's the, the map that they have of the university um, going through the big doors. And then you're faced with the choice of are you going to be healthy or unhealthy to get up to the third floor. Then when you get to the third floor, that's what you, you're faced with. Um, rather sort of worried looking students waiting for tutorials. And then you can just see the receptionist's spiky hair. So I then zoomed in on her and it happened to be Christmas. And I thought it was actually quite an interesting sociological observation that the receptionist was the only person who actually put up Christmas trimmings. Everything else was just completely, you know. Um, so again, that said something about different kinds of personalities that work there. And I like the idea of Christmas music only at this time of year would Bing Crosby, Mud, and a traditional chorus be bedfellows. That is kind of weird, isn't it, Christmas music? Then you go through the security door with your little pass. There's a book swab cabinet. Um, and then you get into the Morgan Centre, and it's this kind of horrible 
generic design space, you know, that everywhere looks identical. So I tried to get the sense of that from the aerial plan of how the desks were laid out. So I talked earlier about this idea of it being theatrical. It occurred to me the other day that it's quite interesting how when photography was first invented, photographers would go out with all their kit onto the street and that would be a theatrical happening, wouldn't it? And people would go, oh, what, what on earth is that? But at that time, everybody would draw. So drawing would have been like, oh, you know, so what? Whereas now, photography is nothing. People are clicking all the time. You don't even notice people taking photographs. But if you, do, if you come out and draw, that has the same kind of significance and everybody's like, oh, what are you doing? So it's kind of weird. There's this circular thing that's happened. Um, and it's because I think it's... It's a, a very analog activity, isn't it, drawing? You know, paper and what, pencils? <laughs> In this very digital world. <laughs> so I think that's why people are quite fascinated by what we do. And I just love the fact that you get people come up to you. I know a lot of people are frightened of that. And I have to say, my hot tip, if somebody comes and looks over your shoulder, don't go, nah. just turn around and say hello. And if you say hello, they'll smile, breaks the tension, it's easy, okay? Because chances are they can't draw. So the chances are, even if you think what you're doing is really rubbish, they're thinking, ooh, that's interesting. Or they're quite often thinking, I used to really enjoy drawing when I was a kid. Why don't I do this anymore? What a brave person coming out here doing that. It's, it's going to be positive, the things they're thinking. So just engage with them, because you have these wonderful connections. So when I was drawing the big heap of earth with the, build, the digger on, the builders came, they wanted to see it, they were all like, oh, that's really interesting, and we all took photos of each other, and, you know, buddies for, for five minutes, and then you never see them again. And I, I think that's just a really interesting thing that happens all the time to me. It's lovely. And the concertinas are great for that because, of course, I go to this full-day thing. I fill one of these books. I'm in the corner doing this and everybody's wondering what I'm up to. At the end of the day, you can go, ba ba and you've got something quite dramatic. And people can come around and look at it, whereas a book's a bit more difficult to share. So I had to do an awful lot of fast drawing. Um, and... The key to that is to get your materials right, to judge what material is appropriate to where you are and, and how long whatever it is is going to be in front of you. So this was, a, there's a little film in my exhibition um, of all the work that I did um, that, that um, the university stumped up for a, a proper filmmaker. So they were filming at Sioux Heath. And I was in the background and I kind of thought, well, this isn't going to last very long. So a fine liner, you can just basically do a contour drawing and record what you can. Another way of doing that, but giving it a bit more oomph, is to use the Cohen or Rainbow pencils. Has everybody come across those? Brilliant things. I mean, they're just like a kid's kid pencil with all the different colours. But it means that something that's a very basic pencil line drawing suddenly has this impact and is, is really funky. So I use that quite often when I know that I haven't got very long. Uh, and the, the one in the, on the end is my beloved ink tense watercolour pencils, which again, if you've got slightly longer, it's fast, but not quite as fast as a single line. But you, the water, you do the, the pencil first, then you put the water on in just seconds, and a line drawing, boom, becomes a painting. So I just love those. Virtually no kit you can paint. So this was an example of using those. We did um, a project um, on the, the, that menthol thing with the E. coli, on people's reactions to the idea that they might be buying pro uh, products in the future that they put in their mouth that have been created by, from E. coli and talk to people about whether that was an issue. Because there's loads of everyday projects, products that have menthol in. So we went to a garden centre and, and were accosting people, basically. So I didn't have very long to draw them. So particularly family with kids, it's, you know, you've got to be really rapid. So the watercolour pencils are really useful and I usually sort of give myself three or four pencils so that you're not trying to, you don't want loads of kit, really, do you? You need to be able to hold it in one hand. Sometimes, though, I sort of wandering around finding things to paint, I had a bit more time. 
Um, I, I like the idea, again, this idea of, of shining light on the everyday. These bins are everywhere in the university, but I guess people don't see them anymore. But they were sort of an important thing. So I sat down and I painted it. And the illustrator in me comes out when I've got more time. I tend to tighten up. And, uh, and I really enjoy the time limit because it actually makes me loosen up a bit. But watercolour, actually, one of the things that has happened over the years is I've used watercolour more and more for speed sketching. It's actually slightly changed the way that I work. Um, and I've started to draw up with the paint. So I've always had a technique where I kind of splosh the paint on first and then draw in watercolour pencils over the top, which is a really good way of getting over the blank paper thing. But I've started to actually literally use paint like a pencil and discovered that it's a really quick medium if you if you kind of just go for it really um, and you, you can get quite an impact for picture and then just using a watercolor pencil just at the end to just define where you need it very much less is more not outlining the watercolor just where you need some sort of detail and the, the joy of the watercolor pencils is they'll work onto the wet paper almost nothing else will draw on wet paper um, so so they're fantastic I've never got the patience to wait for anything to dry. So. And this is a really good example of how that technique worked. I went for that strike day. They all went off to a, a rally at the end after they'd finished picketing. And so it was people standing up and talking for maybe five minutes, ten at most. And then at the end, they asked for people from the floor who wanted to contribute. And there were a lot of people there from different unions. And so these people would just come up and kind of basically go, hey, power to the people, and then go and sit down again. So no time at all. And so I kind of just would splodge the shape of whatever they were doing and then just, again, record with the pencil just what I needed to. And I managed to capture all but one. I missed one person, which was really annoying. The other reason why I sometimes swap media on one book is that sometimes it is a flow of time, but sometimes, you know, you finish halfway through the book and then you're doing something that isn't part of that moment. The two things don't belong together. And so I quite often switch the tools that I'm using so that things don't get as muddied. Uh, so this was the desk that I was squatting on. Um, one of the members of the staff had left, so I appropriated her desk. And I thought it was really funny that she left this cute little sticky thing on the phone and it looks really lost. And I'm, she didn't love me. <laughs> So I sort of drew that in pen and pen and then tinted it. And then I went into a PhD um, tutorial. And so I drew that in the watercolour pencils. So it's just slightly different. As you will notice, there's a lot of text on my sketchbooks. Uh, it serves lots of different purposes. It gives me the means to have this little personal commentary. And so I put my own little bits in here and there um, and to record all the sounds and things. It's also quite a good visual aid. So I'm sure you'll all be, you know, have these situations that will have occurred where you draw something, you draw something else, and it's like, mm, there's that really annoying space or things don't sit very well on the page. So if you add text, you can just use them to rescue the composition. So a lot of my text is doing that. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, I'll put nice bold text there and I'll run a line of text between that thing and that thing and join it all together. Um, so it's very useful. And it's also a way of adding that personal thing into spaces that are not very personal. If you're like here, this was the view from the reception um, area outside the Morgan Centre. So it was like here. It got this big, full height atrium thing. So you couldn't get people in any real sense in the drawing. And it was looking really dull. So I thought, OK, what I'll do is I'll keep my ears open. And as people were coming in and out of reception behind me, I was just listening to their conversations and just grabbing what they said and putting it up. And it's all just all different things. So, you know, somebody saying, you know, I'm worrying about this and that. And somebody else is saying, there's cake and pizza and stuff downstairs left over from the third year party. Oh, you just made my day. There's nothing like free pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't necessarily talking about important stuff. And if you're putting text on your drawings, think about how you can use it in different ways. 
I began to realise, OK, I'm going to be repeating myself visually a lot. So I started to use different ways of, of drawing text. And so, you know, mixing up speech bubbles and, and quotes and using black and colour and taking words, an individual word that has significance in a sentence and, and making that writ large and colourful. And it just, it becomes actually a really interesting visual tool. So the various research I, projects I did, uh, it was just such fun. I had no idea, no idea what I was going to be doing. And uh, so this is the dormant things one I told you about. This was somebody's understairs cupboard. And it was so challenging. I'm, I'm, a narrow hall with a 40-watt bulb up the other end of the hall. And I'm on the floor, and the researcher and the woman are stood in front of me, and she's pulling things out of this cupboard that I can only see here and there as she's pulling them out and talking about them, putting them in a box. And I'm trying to capture it all. I'm trying to draw the objects. I'm trying to draw the stories. Um, so this is one of the few occasions where I painted it afterwards, painted it on the train home, because I just couldn't. It was just line drawings. But it was just really interesting hearing all these little personal stories that kind of told you so much about her life. Um, I like the idea that she described it as the cupboard of shame. <laughs> <laughs> and another project was about lying. So we were accosting people on the street and giving them a scenario in which somebody tells a lie, but the morals of it were not cut and dried. So their, their question was, is this a lie? Does it count as a lie if it's not necessarily a bad thing? And then changing that scenario just slightly, and then saying, well, is it a lie now? Um, so it's really quite interesting. Um, so these were the, the people that were being interviewed. And I thought it was rather funny that we had this bench, it had been raining, and Andy had this idea that people would sit and talk to him on the bench. So we laid all this newspaper out to make sure the bench was dry. And absolutely nobody sat on this bench. Uh, another little story. Another project was about thrift. Um, so we went out with somebody into charity shops that she used to buy stuff in and talked to her about, you know, spending habits. And what I thought was really funny about this one is the person that's going, ooh, this is a nice dress, is not the subject, it's the researcher. <laughs> and this was another one which was about um, <laughs> the weather in this part of the world. Um, there's a, a little place called um, Hebden Bridge up in the hills where it rains even more than it rains in Manchester. And so she did a project on how the weather influences our lives, you know, what we do, how we feel about the day, about ourselves, and just everything in the UK hinges on weather. And so we did two days of drawing. Um, one was on a bad day and one was on a good day. And this was the sunny day. And so all the different things that happen in the same space. On a sunny day, somebody actually paints his canal boat and all the, the pigeons sunbathe, you know. And the buskers come out. This was the mental project. And another project was all about um, dementia. Um, so that's why I went to the Alzheimer's lab. And uh, so we went to uh, a carers, people, people who care for people with dementia. They had like a, a drop-in group. So we went along and, and drew them and talked to them and actually got them painting, which was quite interesting because that actually encouraged conversation. And we did that by actually adapting one of the workshops that I did with the academics because part of my remit was to teach them to draw, which was quite interesting. Uh, they were very bright people. I was quite intimidated by how clever they were. Um, but on the other hand, largely visually illiterate. So it was a very, very odd kind of dynamic. So I was a bit nervous about how I was going to do it, but actually it worked really well. Um, and one of the things I did was I stole an idea from um, Tom Phillips, an artist, um, Royal Academician. And he took a book, it was a trashy Victorian novel, and he found new meanings in the text by isolating certain words and phrases and then obliterated the rest of the text with an illustration of what he was trying to say. And he did this throughout an entire book called The Humorment. And so I gave all the academics sheets of quite dense prose. I think it was something like Salman Rushdie. And challenged them to find words and phrases in there that said something about their research projects and then to paint them. 
And they really rose to the challenge. They were really, really good. And so this was some of the work that they did. And so Andy Barmer, the researcher who's doing the Alzheimer's, he was my star pupil. He, he just really got into drawing. And so he thought it would be really fun to try this with his carers group. And so we gave them the transcripts of their interviews that they'd had with him on a previous occasion and then said, OK, let's see if we can point out certain poignant things or find new meanings in what you said and what you feel and then paint those. And it worked really well. And this, this, this woman, actually, she took all the words beginning with F and put a ring around them because the person she cared for had what is quite common with dementia, you swear all the time. And then she painted a little rainbow in the corner. She said, that's me. I'm trying to be positive in the face of everything else. You know. Somebody else painted it all the color of bruises. So there's a lot of things came out. But because they were working on something that was a very focused subject, they talked a lot, but they talked about the subject. They didn't end up talking about the movies or biscuits or anything. You know. So it worked extremely well as a device. And they got really excited, the researchers, about how the drawing actually brought their projects to life. Because it suddenly, instead of just words on a page in some academic paper, these people suddenly became real people. This is somebody who collected every ticket that they'd ever had for anything they'd ever been to. <laughs> and uh, so I, like, I like that. I, I went through them and I thought, oh, I've partied a lot. <laughs> And this guy at the garden centre, you know, you just know him, don't you? When you see him, what he says has more resonance. So he was sort of talking about his old mum who always had fishermen's friends in the house, you know, which is another thing that's got meant for him. And the other thing that was really interesting was how much poignancy you could bring to objects. So they tried using photographs, the researchers, to add to their research, but it doesn't really work. When you take a photograph of an object, it's just really flat and meaningless. But if you draw an object, it really celebrates it. And also, you can sort of get rid of all the white noise and basically just focus on what you need to focus on. And this was the lady with the understairs cupboard. This was a paint palette that she'd been basically painted with her kids, like you do, and she put it away not knowing that when she put it away, it was the last time that they were going to do that because her kids were growing up. And so she couldn't bear to wash it, let alone throw it away, because it would be admitting to herself that that had gone forever. So it just sat there. And so I painted it and tried to capture as much of the story as I could. And at the end, I showed her all the stuff that I'd painted. And she cried. And I thought, yes. <laughs> And, and it's interesting because as a layman sitting in on a research project, you're looking at different things, you're, you're hearing different things. So I was drawing between the lines of, of what the researchers were recording. So it's just all the little kind of personal stuff. So it was quite a right-on garden centre, this. And I just love the fact this woman's having men's shower gel. That just riles me so much. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and they had this, this pink toothpaste that had been around since time began. And, uh, and people were sort of looking at it and going, oh, my God, you know, imagine you're brushing your teeth with that. It smells of clay and, ugh, it's pink. And it smells like germline. Why on earth would you put that in your mouth? Uh, so, again, it's, it's, just, it's just more vivid, isn't it? So the workshops I did for the academics were interesting. They, they, these are high achievers. They are not used to failing in public, you know, alongside their colleagues. So I got 12 of them, or Sue Heath got 12 of them, to actually volunteer to keep sketchbooks over the year. Um, and they were all terrified, apparently, before they met me. And, uh, and so really, my challenge really was to try and get rid of a lot of their preconceptions and to make it fun. So I did all these empowerment workshops. I did about four or five different workshops. And it was all about doing things like focusing their attention on the process rather than the outcome. I think that's one of the key things that people get wrong when they're trying to draw, is they think, right, I want to draw it, and it wants to look like that. And of course, you know, you're doomed to failure, certainly if it's your first occasion. So the idea is it's not about trying to actually, A, make it look real, and B, 
have all your success focused on whether you actually achieve that. It's about the process. It's about the joy of being in the moment, of actually soaking up what's around you, of exploring the materials, of actually getting a, a real pencil and not a mouse, and actually exploring the marks that that makes. And so we did various things that actually tried to focus their attention in that way. And it worked like a dream, because they were bright people. They got it, and they very quickly got over the fear. And we did a lot of sploshing. You know, we, we threw paint about. And, um, and I got them doing blind contour drawings, which is a great warm-up exercise, where you put a bit of pen paper, put your pencil through a bit of paper, so you can't cheat, you can't see what you're drawing. And then I got them drawing portraits of each other, which, of course, they were bonkers. So they ended up, there was a lot of laughter because you draw these really crazy pictures of each other. And you can't succeed, so it removes the expectation of success because you know it's going to be rubbish before you start. So it worked really well as an, as an icebreaker. And they got really into it. Some of them, that's Andy, my star pupil. Some of them got really, really into it. So these are some of the blind contour drawings that they did of each other. Um, and what's really weird is you often capture a likeness. That, that looks like Sue Heath. And that looks a bit like Andy Barmer. It's really odd. And there's Hazel. She's Hazel, the clatter of keyboards, Hazel. That's her. I also did a thing um, around different ways of looking at things. So I asked them all to bring in some sort of vessel like a cup. And if you place a cup on the desk and try and draw it, you've got all sorts of difficult problems, haven't you, with ellipses and kind of weird stuff that often people can't do. So I said, well, we don't have to do that, do we? Let's, let's turn it and look at, look at it endways on. And then you get a very different shape, and let's draw that. And then let's look at it at a different way, and let's draw that. And I got them to draw different line drawings of the shapes that you could get looking at a cup and just overlapping them on the page and creating something that was designing the page. They'd never thought about that concept ever, the idea that you were designing a page. And so that was quite fun as well. It was just a bit different. And then I got them to paint in the negative space rather than the object because that's easy. You don't have to worry about shading. It can be any colour you like. You can use any medium you like. You can put patterns on it if you want. And then I asked them to think about the object they'd chosen to bring in and, and what it was all about, you know, and then write something in, again, to rescue compositions. So that was a very one-sided composition. Now it works. Worked really well. They were smashing, actually. They were a really, really nice bunch of people. And so as, as soon as they kind of got this idea that, OK, it was fun, they just went for it. This was the sploshing. And the other thing I tried, which worked very well, was uh, we played a, a painting consequences game where I got them into pairs. I wanted them to use watercolour, but again, everybody's frightened of watercolour. If you've never used them before, it's, you, know, you need to get used to what you do with them. So I talked about painting on wet paper and dry paper and a little introduction. Then I got them in pairs to just make a mark and pass it, pass it to your partner, and then your partner makes a mark, and then you pass it back. So it's easy. And then at some point, this thing starts to make a picture because our brains do that. And then they could start to turn it into something. And, uh, and again, that was fun. And they all learned how to use watercolour by the end of it. Um, so much so that the next workshop, I got them all to bring in, bring in fruit or vegetables. And, I, and Hazel painted that. She'd never drawn in her life. She painted that without drawing first, drawing in watercolour. And I just think that's exquisite. Um, so I, I was just so pleased that how well it worked. And so much so that they started to demand um, workshops on how to draw people. And I was like, well, okay, that's a little bit tricky for beginners, but okay. And so we got, we roped PhD students into being our life models. So they had to sort of stand around, you know. And I got them to, to focus on shape. Because the thing with people is if you do them in line, if you haven't practiced your hand-eye coordination, it's very hard to judge the, the sizes of people, the bits. Um, but if you look at the shapes and you paint the shapes, it's much, much easier. So... That was Andy's painting of that person. Again, superb, isn't it? For somebody who doesn't draw, let alone paint. Um, really good, isn't it? I mean, that was, one, that was the best one, but it's still pretty good. 
And the other thing we did, poor, poor devils, we not only made them do all these personal sketchbooks, we got some concertina books that we did as just chain projects. So we had half a dozen of them, each with a theme, going round the department, and, they, and each person had to draw something on the theme and pass it on. And I asked them not to just draw, you know, with the, with the folds, draw your bit, and then somebody else's bit, but to try and flow them together and, you know, draw yours into somebody else's space to kind of link them. And, and they were great. Again, I think because they were bright people and they were up for it, they really took it on board and they did lots of the stuff that we'd done in the workshops. And the, the Constantina books are, are on display in the gallery because they were so gorgeous. And I was just so proud of them. I love that, what, that um, baked on thing on the Pyrex. It's just the perfect texture, isn't it? And they just really took it on board, flowing things. Somebody, this was a, the Dormant Things book. Um, and this was a dormant sewing kit. And look, she's actually sewn a line through it to join the drawings together. It's really nice. And they, they used all the kind of de design devices that I've been talking about. And they, again, they took them on and used them in the books. And it's, yeah, I was so proud of them. There they are. So the sociologists, what did they get out of it? Well, they... They were quite interested in using this idea of concentrated seeing in their work. So Sue Heath is going to be actually taking re um, sociologists out into spaces and getting them sketch crawling so that they experience what it's like to stand somewhere familiar and just stop and look and listen, because it's a different way of actually looking at your surroundings. It was quite interesting, Andy Barmer, when we went into the lab with the mass spectrometer, he said, until he sat and he sat and drew with me, he said, I had never noticed. There was a mass of cables hanging from the ceiling. Just the whole thing was a mass of cables. He'd never seen the cables before, because his attention was on other things. And the other thing was, of course, this idea that you can use drawing as a way of actually recording what you're seeing. So this is an annotated drawing on um, an urban design project. So the students were tasked with going out and looking and analysing the space that they were familiar with and looking at how the university had built it in certain ways to manipulate the ways in which people used the space. Um, so I, I didn't do this on the spot, you know, I, I was pre-warned, so I went out and drew the space and then went out with the students and annotated it with the things that they were saying. So, for instance, an example, there are knobs of steel around the base of that learning centre, which I think always looks a bit scary, um, to stop skateboarders or passers-by sitting on them, you know, so, so they, it's that kind of thing. But by annotating a drawing, again, it has that instant impact thing. So, if you're interested in seeing the work <laughs> that I've been doing, I managed to fill, I think it was about 42, 45 of these concertina sketchbooks over the course of the year. Um, so, I managed to get 27 of them up on the wall in the gallery. So, it's, it was nice, actually, because they, they, they fold up quite small, so they'd be just on the shelf at home, and they didn't look like much for a whole year. But when I then got them on the wall... Suddenly, I had this wonderful, like, oh my God, yeah, that's a huge body of work. And I felt really pleased with myself and quite proud of what I'd achieved. So it's just down the road, basically, just 15 minutes in a straight line from, from here. What are the other galleries? There's, um, on the postcard that everybody had, is um, a, university, a link to the website where they're putting the opening hours on. It's more or less until 6 o'clock during the day, but basically because the work is not under glass and because there's also a table with loads of art materials out, there has to be someone minding the space just in case. So it's, it's basically volunteers that we've coerced into sitting there. So unfortunately, it's not open in the evening, even though it could be just because I couldn't get people to babysit it. So you need to check, but it's more or less open till six every day, um, except this evening when there's going to be a, a reception. So originally it was supposed to be ticketed, but the ticket thing stopped working, so just come, basically. <laughs> yeah, there's a bar and a cafe. We can hang out until they, you can be let in. Um, I put this up because I've just got a new website. My website has always been about my children's book illustration with a few sketchbooks tucked in. So I thought it was about time I had a website that was about my urban sketching. So if you want to sort of read more about the project, see the other kind of similar work I've been doing, 
It's all on lynnchapman.net. Oh, that's it. Not yet, not about the project, no. I mean, literally, it finishes this week. So we've, we're now going to have time to actually kind of absorb what we've done. And I think the academics are definitely going to be writing a paper about it. And, and uh, yeah, I'm thinking that, depending on what happens over the next year, I, if I'm not busy with other things, I would like to actually put it together into a book but it kind of depends on what happens. I've, another university has approached me to do a different project, but we almost certainly won't get the money, but if we do, I'm going to be really busy. If we don't, this will give me something to do. So. I hope that's in a nice place. Um, it's going to be all over if we get it, because it's about architecture. So we're going to be going and drawing in different buildings all over the place. Um, it's about the architecture for care homes. Um, so... So, we've got like about three minutes if anybody would like to ask me any questions. How long are the pieces? Two meters. And in one piece? Yes, that's why I got a roll. Because when you join the paper together, you just have to be a bit careful because any error in the join, it, because of the concertina, it quickly goes off in a kind of weird direction. So, a, a roll was quite handy. Roll what, what? It's Bockingford. And I, Bockingford is the paper, you just buy the roll from them online. And I bought the, the heavyweight one to start with, which is, it's, it's lovely. But it takes, a, it takes a bit of wrestling, that one, because that really does want to stay rolled up. So when I'd used that one up, I bought the lighter weight one, which was a bit, diffi bit more easy to make. Um, yeah. Sorry. They, it was really interesting because, again, they, were, they weren't quite sure what to make of the idea of somebody hanging around, drawing them all the time. Um, but actually, people got used to it really quickly. I think they were a bit anxious when they were doing a presentation. Um, you know, it's like now, you know, you've, you're being filmed. It just makes it that bit more scary. Um, but again, you know, they just you quickly forget. So it, uh, it worked quite well. And the people that I was working with... Um, it was really inspiring for them because they were trying to learn to draw and at the same time they're watching me drawing them and their colleagues and their space. And so they, they, they found that actually a really um, interesting way of learning, watching what I was doing and they were definitely emulating what I was doing in their sketchbooks. So a bit like what we do here, isn't it? You learn as much from each other as you do from the workshops, just looking at each other's books, talking about what you use. I, there is not, there's nothing yet, because literally we've just finished, but there will be a paper on it. What I'll do is, is whatever comes along, I'll pop it on my website. And the film that we made is also going to be on the website. I mean, he's, he's literally delivering it to me on Monday. There's a film actually in the space, um, but he's doing a special cut for me that's got slightly more about the art, slightly less about the sociology. Um, so that will be up on the website in a week or so. So, Lynn, you had a question. It's not a set size. I made it so that I could make best use of the paper, but it's sort of, it's not quite an A4 height. Oh, I've got one here, hang on. I'll show you, that's the quickest. Um, oh, and by the way, thank you to Lucy, who designed this fantastic system. You make one cover, two bits of book board with a bit of tape up the middle, so you've got an easy hinge, dead easy to make, and then all you have to do is cut loads of bits of paper. You don't have any binding, you only have to make the one cover. So Lucy Galton from the, the Manchester Group invented this system and gave me it as a present, so I used it for the entire duration of the project. You need these clips, though, because otherwise what happens is you're drawing and it does that. <laughs> so you have to clip it in place. But that gives you a sense of the, the size that I was working at. It's, I think it's slightly bigger than A5, but slightly skinnier. Yeah. You can buy a special book board, or you can just use any old stuff. The beauty of book board is it doesn't warp um, when you put the cover on it. Um, but... Uh, yeah, and I invented a hinging thing with a bit of Velcro tab, which actually holds it closed. It's a little extra, which is quite handy. 
But I thought I've had sketchbooks where they're attached, and that really gets in the way when you're drawing. So with the Velcro, you can actually do that and get it out of the way, which is quite useful. Anybody else got any other questions? They were lucky to have you. <laughs> oh, thank you. How sweet. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.